Hello and welcome. You're with us here on Business Today. I'm Abha Bakaya. Here are the top stories from the business world. It's a big Business Today TV exclusive. Top government sources have told us that fuel prices are set to be hiked again. Oil companies are facing huge revenue losses and a minimum fuel price hike will be made to lessen their burden. Wholesale prices have risen to an all-time high in the country. WPI rose by a whopping 15% in April versus 14.5% in March. The surge was on account of fuel, vegetable, oil seed prices. Even prices of wheat rose by around 11% in April. Excitement and disappointment on D Street as Bahubali LIC makes its market debut. Parachutes into the list of the five biggest companies. Investors left disappointed after the discounted listing. Sensex rallies 1,345 points, logs biggest single-day gain in three months. Nifty above 16,250. All sectors end in the green. In a huge relief to both the central government and states, power prices at the India Energy Exchange have plunged by nearly half in the past one week. Price of electricity from 9th to 15th May was 5.4 rupees per unit against 10.38 rupees per unit. And uh, this was also versus around 12 rupees a month ago. The $44 billion Twitter deal could be breathing its last with Elon Musk making it clear he will not go ahead if bots and spam account for more than 5%. Analysts say he could be backing out after becoming poorer by nearly 6 lakh crore rupees in the past six weeks. The current stay on the prices of petrol and diesel is set to end soon. Top government sources have told Business Today TV that the prices are set to be hiked again. Meanwhile, the government is unlikely to cut excise duty on fuels due to the current fiscal difficulties. Let's head across to Chetan Bhutani who will give us uh, the full picture and all of the exclusive information. Chetan, take us through all that you've picked up. You know, Abha, after 40 days of this mm. fight of petrol and diesel prices being uh, literally frozen and being stable. Our government sources have exclusively told us uh, that the prices of petrol and diesel could be hiked very soon. In fact, uh, the quantum of diesel would be uh, would be much more than what the prices of petrol would be. Uh, sources telling us that the prices of diesel would be hiked in the range of about rupees uh, three to four per liter, and the price of petrol could be hiked in the range of rupees two to three uh, per liter. Sources are pointing out that such a reason is coming up. Uh, because the oil marketing companies, the OMCs, are facing uh, revenue losses in the range of about rupees 25 to 30 rupees per liter, uh, as far as diesel is concerned, and about rupees 9 to 10 rupees per liter, as far as the petrol is concerned. So clearly, uh, to manage such costs and cover up for these losses, uh, a price hike is imminent. The quantum is yet to be decided, but sources telling us that the price hike could be uh, could be started very soon, and it could it would be a graded price hike and not a one-time steep price hike that the government. I would plan as of today in New Delhi, the prices of petrol uh, stood at about 105.4 rupees per uh, liter and about 96.67 rupees uh, per per liter for diesel. So we clearly, in times to come, we can expect some uh, price hike for petrol and diesel. So clearly, some negative news for the consumers out there. All right, Jaitan, thanks so much for bringing us uh, that exclusive information regarding fuel prices, all set to get costlier there, but in a graded fashion, as Jaitan just described. Now, after receiving a strong response for its 21,000 crore rupee IPO, Life Insurance Corporation of India made a lukewarm debut on Dalal Street. It was a roller coaster ride for the stock on day one after it hit an intraday high of 920 rupees in early trade. LIC ended day one on the bourses at 873 rupees. But uh, despite the tepid listing, LIC becomes the fifth most valuable listed company in India. Indeed, this is a momentous event. LIC IPO is in line with Honorable Prime Minister's vision. The vision to publicly list companies which have hitherto remained unlisted. And LIC has been one of that institution. In fact, it's, I think, probably five minutes. LIC headquarters building is only about five minutes from this place. And of course, it has taken 65 years to 
get listed in Bombay Stock Exchange. As Mr. Pandey rightly said, it's an Atmanirbhar moment. It's also an India moment. I would add it's an LIC moment as well. LIC made a less than stellar debut on bursas at a discount of 9%, hurting all categories of IPO investors. Though foreign investors largely stayed away, the 21,000 crore rupee issue was welcomed with open arms by policy holders, retail investors and LIC employees, in contrast with qualified institutional and non-institutional investors. The listing of LIC shares comes at a time when the market is volatile. FIIS are selling, inflation is rising and interest rate hikes have spooked the Lal Street. There is a downside uh, protection as well. And, uh, you know, a few hours of listing and uh, in, in a particular economic context and change because the context also changes from day to day. And uh, I don't think that should be viewed as, uh, uh, you know, the, the particular thing uh, as an event. It's more like a process and people should be looking at, you know, medium term, short term, medium term and long term horizon and look at how LIC goes forward and its performance. In a tweet, former finance secretary Subhash Chandra Garg said the issue was priced too high and that the LIC's real value was less than half the issue price. He remarked that it looked like LIC shares were rushing towards their right valuation. However, despite the poor listing, a majority of market analysts are positive on LIC and suggest investors to hold them for a long term. Under the LIC IPO, the government offloaded 3.5% of its stake in the insurance behemoth. Even after the reduction in size, LIC's IPO is the biggest public offer of all time in the country and has become India's fifth largest firm by market capitalization today. Bureau Report, Business Today Television. Risk appetite has returned to the Lal Street as markets have their best day in the last three months, extending their gains for the second consecutive session. Indices were supported by metal stocks with insurance behemoth Life Insurance Corporation disappointing at its stock market debut. Nifty reclaimed 16,000, gaining over 400 points to end above 16,200, whereas Sensex gained 1,344 points as all sectors end in the green. The metal index up over 7%, Hindalco being the top gainer soaring nearly 10%, followed by stocks like Tata Steel, Coal India, JSW Steel and ONGC. The rupee, on the other hand, touched another all-time low of 77.79 against the dollar. However, the Indian currency has recovered from record lows after the RBI intervened in both the spot and futures markets, thus helping the rupee to settle at 77.47 against the dollar. In what will be bad news for the online gaming industry, the government is mulling a hike in GST on online skill gaming to 28%. The group of ministers on online gaming, casinos and race courses is set to hold a crucial meeting tomorrow at 11am. Sources tell Business Today TV that officials from Fitment Committee will be sharing their view on the hike. Karishma Sudhani joining us on this. Karishma, tell us what specifically is uh, on the taxation base when it comes to online gaming and has the industry been able to take this development in good stride? Well, Abha, we must understand that uh, the point of debate here is not just increasing from 18 to 28 percent, but it is also the taxation base uh, that the group of ministers are looking at. Right now, you see that the online gaming is being charged uh, uh, with a GST of 18 percent at platform fee, but uh, the proposal that has been sent in is of 28 percent uh, at a contrast contest entry fee, which is uh, rather going to be a big uh, uh, risk, in fact, a big loss for the industry. That is cut the current charge also for the chance uh, gaming. And now it is the opinion of the group of ministers to bring skill gaming at par with chance uh, gaming. Tomorrow, Fitment Committee is going to give a report on this and the group of ministers, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, headed by Meghale and consists of eight uh, key ministers are going 
going to take a decision before it goes to GST Council. Not a good news for industry, but uh, let's wait and watch uh, if uh, the GOM is going to take a conclusion on this after Fitment's report. All right, Krishma, thanks so much for joining us on that. Even before 5G auctions could kick off, the central government has started readying for 6G rollout. Addressing officials and telecom industry at the launch of the 5G testbed, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that a task force is already looking at introducing 6G by the end of the decade. He added that the 5G ecosystem had the ability to boost the Indian economy by $450 billion in the next 15 years. Anuman hai कि आने वाले डेढ़ दशक में 5G से भारत की अर्थव्यवस्था में 450 बिलियन डॉलर का योगदान होने वाला है यानी ये सिर्फ इंटरनेट की गति नहीं बल्कि प्रगति और एम्प्लॉयमेंट जनरेशन की गति को भी बढ़ाने वाला है इसलिए 5G तेजी से रोल आउट हो इसके लिए सरकार और इंडस्ट्री दोनों को कलेक्टिव एफर्ट्स की जरूरत है इस दशक के अंत तक हम 6G 6G सर्विस बिल लॉन्च कर पाए इसके लिए भी हमारी टास्क फोर्स काम करना शुरू कर चुकी है मोबाइल गरीब से गरीब परिवार की भी पहुंच में हो इसके लिए हमें देश में ही मोबाइल फोन की मैन्युफैक्चरिंग पर बल दिया परिणाम यह हुआ कि मोबाइल मैन्युफैक्चरिंग यूनिट्स दो से बढ़कर दो से बढ़कर 200 से अधिक हो गई आज भारत दुनिया का सबसे बड़ा मोबाइल फोन मैन्युफैक्चरर है और जहां हम अपनी जरूरत के लिए फोन इंपोर्ट करते थे आज हम मोबाइल एक्सपोर्ट के नए रिकॉर्ड बना रहे हैं is the world's richest man chickening out of the audacious Twitter deal? Was the shocking and surprise announcement to buy and take Twitter private just another of Elon Musk's sassy social media adventures? Well, that's what the $44 billion Twitter deal is looking like right now. Investors in Twitter are poorer by 80,000 crore rupees in just 21 days. That is how much the Twitter share has fallen, wiping away all the gains made in the past month. The rise and fall, both thanks to this man, the tech geek turned world's richest man Elon Musk. On the 11th of April, he announced his hostile takeover bid of Twitter, promising to turn it into a cathedral of free speech without its own censors, subject only to the laws of the land. His Moses Act parted the Twitterati into two, those who loved him and those on the other side of the spectrum. Musk enjoyed the spotlight and the adulation of his fans for a full one month before shocking everyone by putting the deal on hold on Friday the 13th of May. Citing reports that bots, spam and fake accounts compromised more than 5% of Twitter users. Shares slumped more than 10% on fears that Musk could be looking at excuses to pull out of the deal. The beleaguered CEO of Twitter, the Indian origin Parag Agarwal, tried to douse the fire, saying Twitter suspends more than half a million accounts every day and locks several millions accounts every week. This was Elon Musk's response to the long series of tweets, followed a few hours later by his definitive tweet. Musk made it clear that the deal will not move ahead without Twitter clarifying that fake accounts did not exceed 5% of its 23 crore users. For many, this is the final nail in Twitter deal. 
Analysts feel Musk could not have been ignorant of the spam and bouts issue when he offered to buy the company. So what is the deal with Musk's oscillation? The world's richest man has lost $75 billion or 5.8 lakh crore in personal wealth in the past month and a half, all because of a slide in Tesla share. While he was able to arrange some funding for his 21 billion personal equity portion of the Twitter deal, he's still a distance from arranging the entire kitty, a task which now looks more and more improbable given his own slide in fortunes. Bureau Report, Business Today Television. We take a quick break. On the other side, we get you uh, an exclusive conversation with the new CII top boss, Sanjeev Bajaj. Two frontline ships of the Indian Navy will be launched by Defence Minister Rajnath Singh. The launch refers to ships entering the water for the first time. Surat ship is a stealth destroyer under the project 15B. And the second ship is Udaygiri, a part of project 17A. Next generation stealth guided missile destroyer of the Indian Navy. Built using block construction methodology. Reversible gas turbines. Length is 160 meters and the weight is 7,400 tons. It has improved stealth features, advanced weapons and sensors management system. It can gain a speed of 28 knots and a range of 4,000 nmi and it has a length of 113 meters. The launch of these ships marks their entrance into the water for the first time. The nation will witness a landmark event in the history of indigenous warship building when two frontline warships of the Indian Navy will be launched concurrently at Mazgaon Docks Limited in Mumbai on 17th May, said an Indian Navy official. Hello and welcome to Business Today. I am Siddharth Zarabi and with me today, the newly appointed President of Industry Body, CII, Mr. Sanjeev Bajaj, also uh, well known as the CMD of one of India's largest NBFCs, Bajaj FinServe. Uh, welcome to Business Today, Sanjeev. And before I begin, congratulations for taking up um, what is clearly an important job when it comes to broader industry, government relationships and the reach out. I want to begin by asking you about your own assessment of the economic situation that we are currently in from February when we had last heard you around the time of the budget to now, things have changed quite a bit. What's your own assessment? Thank you, Siddharth. Um, we clearly have some tailwinds from the last few quarters where we've seen a steady increase in growth. We've seen uh, the capital investment cycle start uh, across multiple private uh, sectors um, like uh, not only your uh, chemicals, not only commodities, but also transportation, also electricity. We are seeing this in real estate and housing. Um, unfortunately, also because of the impact of war, uh, and in this case, we're talking of the economic impact. Uh, we are seeing further disruption in supply chain. We are seeing the effect of higher oil prices, which is causing inflation uh, to rear its uh, ugly head up. And these require resolution. We believe that there are actions that can be taken to moderate the impact of inflation so that uh, 
we continue to see the growth on the domestic consumption cycle we continue to see the strong exports in india with the changing geopolitical uh, situation as a even greater opportunity and uh, we continue to see this uh, capex investment cycle uh, growing across multiple more sectors sanjeev uh, we've seen the last 3 years of the economy pass through a couple of cycles i don't want to go too much into the past but for the present how surprised are you at the uh, specter of inflation and the price rise that we have seen which is now becoming more generalized and while some of it was attributable to post covid and you know uh, the manufacturing led part of it now inflation has suddenly become the greatest worry on the horizon you know one thing uh, sadar though the last uh, many years actually since the global financial crisis uh, that industry has learned is to live in uncertain times uh, when we think one crisis is just about over another one somehow seems to pop up and hence building agile businesses is more important than anything else in the current situation where it comes to inflation while we see multiple factors both real and uh, those that are created because of external uncertainties the to the common man the two big drivers are food fuel prices and food prices now we are hoping that uh, we have another good monsoon as the early forecast seem to show which means that uh, that along with strong msp should take care of at least uh, food prices as far as fuel prices is concerned in the last few years when oil prices were low uh, taxes have gone up and that is where as cii we suggest that the center and states Uh, through a collaborative uh, effort bring down taxes uh, so that it burns less of a hole in the common man's pocket we believe that this will also have multiple uh, uh, growth effects on the economy because uh, that will aid then the consumption cycle which will then further aid the next investment cycle so that is what uh, we hope happens in the immediate short term sanjeev we saw uh, in the last few months uh, a a uh, bit of a strange situation play out as far as pump prices are concerned of petrol and diesel from november till elections there was no increase then there was a sudden spurt spread over a few days 10 rupees now for 40 days and counting prices have been frozen again this is clearly against the daily price movements uh, a formula that had been put in place how comfortable or uncomfortable are you with this kind of a situation well the reality is that oil prices have gone up but they need to be transmitted and uh, we believe that a more uniform transmission uh, makes more sense it just helps to reduce volatility around that also for everybody concerned whether it's the individual or with businesses um, i'm not going to get into the politics of that that's a completely different issue well uh, i understand that and if we if i kind of recap your answer you are saying on one hand Uh, let the market forces drive retail prices but also use uh, the lever that is with state governments which is the uh, vat as well as the center which is excise to provide relief to the common man and we'll see what happens the other part and this is uh, something i'm very keen to hear your thoughts on as as one of india's smartest finance brains how much will interest rate hikes control supply, supply side led food inflation as you know uh, your monetary policy can largely take care of demand side not supply side so uh, it will have some impact but it cannot be the only action and that's why we we have to see that supply side constraints also get removed we have to bear with those for a certain period of time and that's why as i mentioned earlier we are hoping for a good monsoon which will uh, partly take care of it sanjeev can high interest rates play spoil, spoil sport with the uh the recovery of which we had already seen good signs emerge i don't think so that for the current level of interest rates let's keep in mind that uh, interest rates are significantly lower than uh, prior to start of the pandemic what we're just seeing is a normalization of that cycle uh, beginning and uh, that's what we would actually expect for a few more interest rate hikes we just hope that uh, rbi of course uh, sprang a surprise this time in the timing otherwise has been very circumspect of balancing this out and providing a reasonable set of triggers on the basis of which uh, they would decide we hope that when they come back in june they do the same thing so that it allows industry to align with it and plan for it 
Um, having said that, you know, we've come out of this pandemic actually stronger. Whether you're a bank or whether you're a manufacturing entity, uh, everybody has tightened their belts, um, margins, as you know, we saw record profits um, yes. over the last year or so. Some of that has got eaten up by input costs going up, but we are still much better than where we were two years ago. Uh, also, unlike in most cycles where in times of excess liquidity and low interest rates, you see huge investments, this time, because of the pandemic, uh, we did not see the, those investments. We actually saw deleveraging of balance sheet. So I believe we are primed right now for uh, higher uh, investments. Uh, the external situation is something that is uncertain. So I'm just hoping that less the impact of that, easier it will become for private sector to move ahead. Sanjeev, by Diwali, what would be the average interest rate on a rupees 30 lakh loan for purchasing a home? Okay, I, I don't have my calculator right now. <laughs> it also it depends on uh, tenor. But let's put it this way. If you look at homes um, over uh, the home purchase over the last four or five years, one, we had seen very large capacity coming up about four or five years ago. So till a year ago, you saw new, new, no new capacity. If at all net, it was reducing. That cycle is starting up again. Also, unlike in the West, for most, almost for 90% Indians, buying a home is a primary purpose of living in there. It is not a, it's not an investment uh, asset and uh, speculation around that. And hence, even if rates were to go up to some extent, as you know, these are floating rate uh, loans. That's why in the last few years, uh, homeowners have benefited from that. They will pay a little bit more. But in the net, we must encourage more construction of homes, get more people to buy homes. That not only provides them security, it's also a huge employment driver in our country. And I wish you all the very best for your agenda at CII, Sanjeev. Uh, hope to catch up with you once again. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your time with us on Business Today. Thank you, Siddharth. Good talking. Marine transport delivers goods via sea routes. We 